radiation. Uh, we started talking briefly about thermal radiation. We haven't gone into the uh, full scale uh, methods of quantifying things. So, a very brief recap. Thermal radiation is energy emitted by matter as a consequence of its temperature. Energy emitted as a consequence of uh, temperature, okay, which causes the excitation of uh, the atomic structure, so there is oscillatory vibratory motion of the atoms in the molecules due to the temperature, and the temperature is a measure of this molecular activity, okay, so that's essentially what it is, uh, and this energy is emitted in the form of electromagnetic waves, which implies that the intensity of this energy emitted is going to be a function of the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave that is coming out and transmitting this energy. Okay, and uh, we looked at the entire electromagnetic spectrum last time. Our interests are much more narrower, and uh, the range that we will be limiting ourselves to, which is called the thermal radiation range, is from 0.1 to 100 micrometers. So in the EM spectrum, Thermal radiation is from 0.1 to 100 micrometers. Even though you will see that we will perform our integration from 0 to infinity, which means that we are encompassing all ranges of the wavelength, we will eventually narrow it down to a particular range of the spectrum. Okay? If I draw it out a little bit. Point one to one hundred micrometers, a portion of this falls in the ultraviolet range. So from here to here. The ultraviolet range, which is approximately at around uh, point two to point three micrometers. And then we have a portion of this in the visible light range. This goes from 0.3 for violet to around 0.7 or 0.75 for the red color. And the remaining portion of the thermal radiation spectrum is infrared. last class, what we see as visible light is really radiant energy that is falling on our eyes and creating the perception of sight. Okay? Solar radiation, I want to clarify a couple of things that I spoke about last time. In solar radiation, what happens is that the process of generation of energy within the sun is taking place in its inner core. That happens by nuclear fusion. Okay? The temperature within the inner core is like millions of kelvins. 16 million, 17 million Kelvin. This energy that is generated is going to radiate out from the core onto the subsequent layers of the sun, and when it comes and hits the outermost surface layer of the sun, the temperature is a healthy 6,000 Kelvin. It's still very damn hot. And at this 6,000 Kelvin, the molecules on the outer surface, they oscillate, they start vibrating, and as a result, this energy is transmitted to us as thermal radiation, and so the energy that we are seeing from the sun, a major portion of that falls in the visible spectrum. Okay? Even though the reactions that is taking place in the core are nuclear fusion. Okay? So I want to clarify this point. On the other hand, if you look at gamma rays and so on, there is also a nuclear reaction taking place there, but that's radioactive decay. That's a different process from nuclear fusion or nuclear fission. We are not going to be spending time on these concepts. Rather, we'll build upon other things that are more useful to quantify thermal radiation. But I want to clarify this point. So, sun, somewhere around the, all the way from there to there, around 
0.2, 0 0.3 micrometers approximately, all the way to around 3 micrometers. This is the solar radiation spectrum from the outermost surface of the sun. And as you can see, a major portion of that is in the visible range. So we see the energy in the form of visible light that comes to us. All right. So what is our plan for radiation heat transfer? And I want to revisit some ideas that we may have seen in the past when we started heat transfer a couple of years back, okay, this semester. So from before, let's say that I have a surface. We said that there is an emissive flux coming from the surface because of the fact that anybody at a finite temperature is going to emit radiant energy. Okay, so there is an emissive flux, capital E. Okay, but this is also going to be the case that as much as the surface is emitting radiant energy, you are also going to have radiant energy emitted by the surroundings which is going to fall on the surface and this we call as irradiation which is capital G. This irradiation, because of certain assumptions that we make, a portion of this is absorbed by the surface. And a portion of this is reflected by the surface. And the reflected and the absorbed portions, if you put them together, this becomes your total irradiation G. G is irradiation, which is G absorbed, G reflected. We are assuming that there is no transmitted, because we are assuming thermal radiation to be a surface phenomenon. All right, this is a big assumption, but for opaque bodies, such as the solids, and the type of fluids that we study, this is a very reasonable approximation. Okay, there is nothing wrong with that. G absorbed and G reflected, we can say that can be written as a fraction of G, as alpha times G plus rho times G. Okay, where alpha and rho are the absorptivity and the reflectivity. These are parameters that can be determined experimentally. What we are interested in is the following, okay? Here is a surface, it's at a finite temperature. The surface is talking to its surroundings, so there is radiant energy coming from the surface, radiant energy falling on the surface. I want to calculate the net radiant flux coming from the surface onto the surroundings, which we call as Q double prime radiation. This is the net flux from surface two surroundings, and this can be written as the following, so Q double prime radiation is the emitted, right, minus the absorbed flux. That is, we are looking only at the quantities that have the capability to increase the thermal energy of the surface. So the emitted one is going to change the thermal energy, internal thermal energy. Whatever is absorbed within the first few microns of the surface is going to change the thermal energy of the surface as well. Okay? Now, what we will do in radiation heat transfer is we will say, okay, if this is for a real surface, I'm going to calculate this emission flux as a fraction of the emissive flux of an ideal surface. So we're going to say this is some epsilon times E suffix B, okay? So this is your textbook definition for E suffix B. Is the emissive flux of a black body, 
I will not be using that term. I will be calling it as the emissive flux of an ideal emitter or an ideal body. But I just want you to be aware of how your textbook defines that. This is a quantity that can be obtained by making use of fundamental radiation physics, okay, using Planck's law, using Maxwell's contributions, using Wien's law of displacement, and you bring everything together in the form of the Stefan Boltzmann equation. Okay, so this is obtained from theory. So that's capital E. G absorbed, I can write it as alpha times G, where alpha is a fraction and the G is the total irradiation. The total irradiation G can be obtained by making use of certain approximations which lead us to using Kirchhoff's laws of radiation. Okay, so this comes from, so this is from Planck's theory. That is the emissive flux from an ideal body is obtained from Planck's theory, Max Planck, a German physicist. This is obtained from Kirchhoff. same person who came up with the current and voltage loss, but this is a different law, this is for an ideal surrounding. Alpha and epsilon are experimentally obtained parameters. And so our aim is, have all of these four things E suffix B from Planck's law, Planck's theory, G from Kirchhoff's law, alpha and epsilon from experiments, but we don't perform experiments, which means that we have to make use of certain foundational definitions in order to obtain alpha and epsilon. Okay? And that's what we're going to be spending the next 45 minutes of our time on. Okay? So this is the whole ball game. This is the sole equation that I'm needing to use, wherever that is. There's a net flux from the surface the surroundings. I want to introduce you to a new term. I look at that equation, Q double term radiation. This epsilon times E minus alpha G, I can write it as the following. It is G minus rho times G. And if I combine the rho times g and the epsilon times e, I end up with the following. This is going to be epsilon e suffix b, I'm sorry, plus rho g minus capital G. This term in the bracket, I'm going to call it as capital J, and J is defined as the radiosity of the surface. That is, what is the net emissive flux plus what is the portion of the irradiation that is reflected by the surface. The combination of these two is called the radiosity. It is just a matter of definition so that it is simplifying our ideas and it is much easier to experimentally obtain the emitted plus the reflected rather than just the emitted. It is harder to isolate just the emitted. Okay, so this is going to be capital J. And so this is J minus G. I'm going to write here capital J radiosity. And this is the first new definition of the day. And once again, just to reiterate the things that we're going to do in the following order come up with a way of estimating epsilon and alpha. First thing. In doing so, we need to revisit what is meant by capital E suffix B, which comes from Planck's theory. So we will look at what is the characteristic of an ideal emitter, what is the characteristic of an ideal absorber. All of these combined together is the characteristic of an ideal body that produces thermal radiation. The sun is the closest approximation to an ideal body that we have. That's why solar radiation is so important to us, because it is the standard or the benchmark against which everything else is going to be compared. 
And then once we have everything, we will develop what is called as a radiation network. Once again, using the idea of resistance. This resistance will be different from the resistance you saw before, which is for conduction and convection. One cannot conflate the two ideas. Okay, they are two disparate things. All right. So let's start with our uh, definitions. First one there. The second one is going to be called as the intensity of emitted radiation. First, I'm going to label this term as capital I, I for intensity, because of the fact that thermal radiation, the radiant energy is a function of the wavelength, because it's emitting energy in the form of waves, and because it's also a function of direction, depending on what direction the emission is coming into, the intensity can change. So the intensity of the emitted radiation is a function of wavelength lambda. So typically, you will put the letter lambda here. Then you will put the subscript little e, which implies that it is emitted radiation. So this lambda is wavelength. This is emitted. And of course, it's dependent on direction, and so as to not crowd the field by putting all of these things in the, in the subscript, we're going to write it in the following manner. This is lambda, dependence on wavelength, functional dependence. Then this is going to be theta and phi, which I'm going to define in a second. Theta and phi are the directional dependencies. And of course, intensity is dependent on the temperature as well. But I will not keep writing the temperature dependency because it is quite evident that everything is dependent on temperature. Okay? So there are three things that I'll write for every variable starting today. Lambda, theta, and phi. Lambda is the dependency on wavelength because energy is emitted in the form of electromagnetic waves. Theta and phi are directional dependencies because we're going to say that whatever is emitted by a surface can be captured by a huge hemispherical bowl that is placed around the surface. So that behooves the definition of a spherical polar coordinate track. This is the only lecture I'll be defining these things very carefully. I will not be repeating this information again. Okay? Okay. And things can get a little funky or something. So, what is the definition of this guy? So, I lambda comma e. Lambda, theta, and phi is defined as the rate of radiant energy over wavelength range, lambda and lambda plus d lambda, per unit solid angle, per unit normal of the emitting area along the specified direction. This is a lot of words. Not right is the rate of radiant energy Rate of energy is watts, right? W, capital W, watts. Rate of radiant energy emitted over the wavelengths lambda and lambda plus d lambda, so over a fraction of the wavelength range. Okay, so d lambda essentially is a fraction per unit solid angle. in a second, capital omega, d omega is the fraction of a solid angle, per unit area, long specified direction, theta and phi, and this essentially is an area of the emitted surface normal to this direction. So this is the emitted area, area of the emitted surface, normal 
theta phi dash. This is the big bang. If you understand this, radiation is over. Okay, now let's start whittling down piece by piece what is meant by solid angle first. And before that, I'm going to draw the spherical polar coordinate system. I'm not sure that many of you have come across this. I just want to refresh our memories. Okay? So spherical polar. coordinate system. I'm going to draw a sphere. A sphere has two circles. It has the great circles. One of them is a longitudinal circle. The other is a latitude. So here are the latitudes. And the meridional circles are the longitudinal circles. The latitude. Or what is also called as the azimuthal circle. And then I have the meridional or the longitudinal or the zenith circles. Meridional or the zenith. Like how good it is, right? You have latitude, you have longitudes. From the center, setting up a Cartesian frame, okay? X, Y, and Z. And from some point on this longitudinal circle, I'm going to drop a perpendicular onto the xy plane. Starting here. That's a perpendicular onto the xy plane. So this angle is 90 degrees here. And I'm going to draw a longitudinal circle, a latitude on the top as well here. Okay. And uh, from the center, of this coordinate system, I have the radius, which is passing through this point. It's a sphere, so the radius is constant everywhere. This is the radius r. Some arbitrary radius r, not really caring about that. Then I define the two angles, the zenith angle theta. Theta. This is the direction of increasing theta. So the longitude is a line of constant theta. Okay? I'm sorry, constant phi. I'm going to draw that phi. Sorry about that. It's not constant theta, it's constant phi. Phi is called the azimuthal angle. So at any point on the longitude, I'm going to have a constant phi. At any point on the latitude, I'm going to have a constant theta. Okay? So phi is the azimuthal angle. Theta is the zenith angle. These circles here, these are circles of constant theta. And the other circle that you see, the meridional circle, they are circles of constant phi. spherical polar coordinate frame. And why are we using this for radiation heat transfer? That's a really valid question. But before I answer, I have to define what is meant by a solid angle. Okay? And let me complete my definitions for the day, and then I'll be happy to answer questions towards the end of lecture as well. Okay, so let me just get around to the material. Solid angle, perhaps, is also maybe relatively new to some of us. 
Maybe some of you have come across this before. Here is how I think about it. Okay? Suppose I want to eat a slice of pizza. I measure the slice of pizza by saying, okay, give me a pizza of arc length, 25 millimeters. Or and if I'm not fasting, then maybe three centimeters. Right? So this is how I define the slice of the pie by specifying the circumferential length, which I call as DL. And the circumferential length is obtained by specifying the plane angle. If I call that as d theta, not to be confused with the zenith angle theta, this is a completely different thing. If I call this as the radius r, then dl is r times d theta. This is the plane This is typically used to specify the length of planar curves. The arc length of planar curves. What if I'm interested in specifying the surface area of a curved body? That is, rather than look at a slice of pizza, how about I look at the slice of a watermelon? To define that, I need to define something called as the solid angle, which is the counterpart of the plane angle in three dimensions. Okay, so let me first draw the figure and I'll mark out the angle for you. For simplicity, I'm drawing a hemisphere. So now, I'm drawing a hemisphere, and on there, this is the area that I'm interested in. So it's essentially like plucking out a slice of the watermelon and say, you go to a vendor and say, give me 25 solid angles of watermelon. Of course, they're going to look at you like you're a lunatic. But this is useful for us in terms of defining how thermal radiation works. So the solid angle is going to be defined as the following. If I call this area as dA, this is a hemisphere, so the radius is going to be r, some radius r. Okay. The solid angle d omega, which I have marked by drawing this circle, d omega is defined as dA by r square. And you'll, you'll see the meaning of this once I do some calculations. Okay, so hang on. This is the definition of the solid angle. <coughs> and now I'm going to draw the azimuthal and the zenith angles. So here is one of them. If I call this as the angle phi, then I'm looking at a small slice, which is of d phi. So this angle here is d phi, and if I'm looking at the radius r, then the angle in here, this is theta, and this angle is d theta. Does my figure make sense to everybody? I'm looking at two angles here. One is the angle d phi, which is on the base here of this hemispherical bout. The other angle is this angle d theta, which is the angle subtracted by the two radial lines. That's not the solid angle. It's a planar angle that I'm working. Yes? Can you draw like the spherical for like, so both theta and d are both constants? In which one? The spherical factor. Theta and phi are not constants. They can change. They're not constants. They, these are lines of constant theta and lines of constant phi. If I choose a different latitude or a different longitude, likewise, I'm going to have a different theta and a different phi. Okay? All right. Now, if this radius is r and if this angle here is d theta, then this arc length here is going to be r times d theta. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. 
this arc length here, which is approximately the same as this arc length, is going to be r times d theta. And if I call this line as the radius r, this is 90 degrees right there, which means that that little triangle there is going to be r times cosine theta and r times sine theta. So this height is r cosine theta, which means that those two lines that I have drawn on the top are going to be r times sine theta each. So this guy is r times sine theta. Okay, that one angle uh, there, one, one side there, this is also the same. They are all right angle triangles. If this angle is d phi, this angle there is also d phi. Does this make sense to everybody? And if I want, if you want, I can redraw the figure again just to mark only the angles. I think it might be a reasonable idea. So first angle that I'm looking at is here. This is d theta. The second angle I'm looking at is this one, which is d phi. Okay, and if that is d phi, then its counterpart at the top here is also d. Does this make sense to everybody? If this radius is r, if this angle is theta, then I have a right angle triangle here. That being the right angle. And essentially, I'm just taking that right angle triangle and rotating it by an angle d phi to get the other dotted line that I see. So that the radius on top here is the same as that. And that's going to be r times sine theta. Which means that the arc length here is r times d theta. Right? Essentially, I'm just using the plane angle d theta, the radius r, and r times d theta. The arc length right here is r sine theta times the angle d phi. So I have two planar angles. I'm using that to define a solid angle. And this total area now, if I think of it approximately as a rectangle, is r times d theta multiplied by r times sine theta times d phi. That's the total area dA. So dA is r times sine theta d phi. That's one of the arc lengths. And the other arc length is r d theta. And if I now define the solid angle d omega, is d a by r square, which is r square sine theta d theta d phi by r square. And r times r is r square sine theta, then d theta d phi. The r square cancels off. And so d omega is sin theta, d theta, d phi. This is the elemental solid angle. This is measured in the units called as the radians, like how we would measure angle in the planar case as the radians. So this is radians. And this is still radians. And it will soon be clear what the steradian means. Okay, or it is Short-hand notation is SR, like you do RAD for radians. This is in steradians. This is just for an elemental angle. Now I'm going to integrate it for the hemisphere. So omega, hemisphere, is what? I have to integrate over the entire range of d theta. I have to integrate over the entire range of d phi. 
uh, integral over theta, integral over phi. Let's do the integral over phi first. Can somebody tell me the range for a hemisphere? What's the range of phi? Start from zero, I'll tell you that. Zero to? Two pi, two pi full circle. What's the range for theta? Yes? Pi by 2. Pi by 2. 0 to pi by 2. Integrate sine theta d theta d phi. Integral of sine theta is minus cosine theta. Okay? So this is just an integral, there is no relationship, uh, there is no functional dependence on phi, so I can integrate over d phi first, so this is just 2 pi. Integral over d phi from 0 to 2 pi is just 2 pi minus 0, which is 2 pi. And then integral over theta, so that's minus cosine theta, from 0 to pi by 2, minus 0 to pi by 2, yes. Oh, yes, thank you. Absolutely. Sorry. Let's theta from pi by 2 to 0 is minus 1, minus and minus becomes a plus. So this is 2 pi. 2 pi square radians is the total solid angle for a hemisphere. So for a full sphere, the total solid angle is going to be 2 times this, which is 4 pi. So omega of a sphere is 4 pi. And now we can come to a functional definition of the solid angle. Okay. The solid angle of a sphere is nothing but the surface area of a unit sphere. What's a unit sphere? A unit sphere is a sphere whose radius is equal to 1. What's the surface area of a sphere? 4 pi r square. So if the radius is equal to 1, the solid angle of a sphere is nothing but the surface area of a unit sphere. The solid angle of a hemisphere is the surface area of a hemisphere whose radius is equal to 1. A plane angle of 2 pi is nothing but the arc length of a circle whose radius is equal to 1. So that is the counterpart that you're seeing. Okay, and I want to write this statement down, think about it. The plane angle, 2 pi is the arc length of a unit circle, right, what's the circumference of a circle, 2 pi r, if the radius is 1, the arc length of the circle is 2 pi. By the same token, a solid angle of 4 pi, or 2 pi, it's for a hemisphere, 4 pi is for a full sphere. This is nothing but the surface area of a unit sphere. And this is all definitions, okay? This is not something that I cooked up. And so if you're defining the arc length of a curve, you're dealing with the planar angles. If you're defining the surface area of curved bodies, you're dealing with solid angles. Why do we need solid angles? Is because we are dealing with surface areas and radiation heat transfer. Radiant energy is coming out in all directions. And if I can imagine myself placing an imaginary hemisphere over the surface here, I can then try to capture whatever is the radiant energy that is being emitted by the surface and start saying, okay, on this particular patch, what is the radiant energy that I'm seeing? And so on and so forth. Okay, so it's a way of characterizing how this radiant energy is coming. So with all this said and done, let us now go back to the definition of the intensity of the emitted radiation. And I'm going to write it down. With your permission, I'm going to bring down one of those panels there. Okay? If a couple of you are taking pictures done. I'm going to bring this down. Because this is where we had our definition. So we go back to this. I lambda comma e is now defined as the following. I lambda e lambda 
theta and phi. It is defined as the radiant energy rate, which I'm going to call as dq, that is emitted by a small area dA, and I'm going to draw that figure in a minute, by a fraction of the wavelength that is coming out from this emitted area d lambda per unit solid angle, d omega, per unit area normal to the direction of the emitted ray. So this I'm going to call as dA suffix n. And we're going to draw a figure that will help us understand this. you're seeing at the bottom is a small shaded portion. This is the area of interest for us. This area is dA. From this area, I want to categorize how the radiant energy is coming out. Okay. And I'm saying, okay, this can be captured by placing this imaginary hemispherical bulb. This is all completely imaginary, okay? Just for the sake of convenience, because we are assuming it's going to go out in all directions. We are assuming it to be a surface phenomenon. So I'm not interested in what's going on beneath this area. I'm interested only in what's going on above this area. So to capture that, place this imaginary bowl, specified by a set of directions, theta, and the direction phi. I want to see, first of all, what is the area that is normal to this particular ray here. That is the projected area of this surface normal to that particular direction is what I'm interested in, okay? Which is what we had written down there. This is the area of the emitted surface that is normal to that particular direction, which means this is nothing but the projected area. And why am I interested in the projected area is the following reason. Forget that there is a hemisphere, just a semicircle. Imagine there is this line here which is acting as this area dA, so let me call this area as dA. Imagine that I'm sitting successively at different locations on the top of this semisphere. So this is location 1, location 2, location 3. At location 2, I'm at an angle of theta from the vertical. Let's imagine that you are getting the radiant energy only from this surface dA and nothing from anywhere else, okay? My question to you is this. If I sit at the location number one, wouldn't I see the most intensity coming out from this area dA? Because that's where the largest area dA is seen by me. If I sit at location labeled three, would I see any intensity coming out from this area? It is just going to be a point. There is no intensity coming out. Which means that as I go from location 1 all the way to location 3, as the angle theta increases, I am going to be seeing lesser and lesser and lesser of this area dA. And that amount that I see is nothing but dA times cosine theta. When theta is equal to 0, I see the total area dA, which is at the location 1. When theta is equal to 90 degrees, when I am sitting at location 3, I don't see anything of this area. And so the area that is normal to the specified direction is dA times cosine theta. So at any point, this area I see is dA. This area I see there is dA times cosine theta. And the area right I see at location 3 is 0. It's a point. point area is basically nothing. And so instead of writing as dA suffix n, I'm going to substitute dA times cosine theta. Okay? So that's my next step. 
fraction of the radiant energy emitted by the area dA, right, emitted by the area dA, so dQ is in watts. This is the radiant energy emitted by the area dA. Rate of radiant energy. from dA divided by d lambda instead of d omega we can substitute in terms of theta and phi and if I raise this board for a second you will see that expression right here d omega was sine theta d theta d phi okay so for sake of Simplicity, I'll write it here. Sine theta d theta d phi. So do that substitution. Sine theta d theta d phi. And then instead of that normal area, which is the area along the direction of theta and phi, I'm going to substitute dA times cosine theta. And right now things may seem as if they're not making much sense. Wait for it. Everything will come back to it. Okay? This is the definition. And I'm going to reverse the tables and I'm going to say, okay, now instead of saying I lambda comma e is dq by this beast here, I'm going to say dq is i lambda times all of this slopes. So dq then is lambda comma e, lambda theta phi, d lambda first one, then I'm going to have sine theta times cos theta, V theta, D phi, and then DA. And the idea is this, if by hook or crook, I am able to measure this quantity. I obviously know the direction that I specify, so theta and phi are known to me. And if I can measure this quantity, then I also know what wavelength fraction I'm sitting at. Perhaps I'm interested in the radiant energy by the surface in the violet region. So I know the wavelength fraction there. So if I can measure this guy, I have information on all the other things. I can actually find out the flux that is emitted by the fractional area dA. What is the flux? Flux is nothing but the rate of radiant heat transfer divided by the area. Okay, so I'm going to write that here. So dQ double prime is a radiant flux by dA, which is nothing but dQ divided by dA, flux is nothing but the rate of heat transfer by the area, and this is all of these fellows put together without the area dA, this is just I lambda E sine theta cos theta d theta, d phi, d lambda. But remember, this is just the flux emitted by a fractional area. Which means that if I want the flux emitted by this fractional area over the entire range of directions, then I have to perform an integration over theta, over phi. If I want this to be over the entire wavelength range, I have to integrate over d lambda as well. So there are three integrals that are going to be done in order to obtain the net emissive flux. Okay, so capital E is the net emissive flux, which is the radiant flux per unit area, this is going to be integral, first of all from the wavelength range 0 to infinity, and we will later on narrow it down to the thermal radiation range, 
then from it's a hemispherical shell that we are still interested in because for us radiation is a surface phenomenon. We are not interested in things happening beneath the surface. So for me, phi still goes from 0 to 2 pi. Theta goes from 0 to pi by 2. I'm going to have that quantity i lambda comma e, which can be experimentally obtained. And trust me, you'll see that soon. Lambda theta phi sine theta cos theta, first integral over d theta, second integral over d phi, and third over d lambda. And this is the creature that we are interested in calculating. As I said at the beginning of the lecture, you see capital E. And to obtain this capital E, I need to obtain this I lambda comma E. To obtain this I lambda comma E, I have to make use of the definition of an ideal body. Once I have all of these pieces put together, it is just a question of putting them all apart. Okay? So this is the net 